Hello, and welcome to Osiroshi Saturday. I'm your host, Unrested, and this is the show that deals with the darkest parts of Asia's lore, legends, and myths. Today we're going to be discovering a little bit about myths and legends surrounding no Gaku. Also revolving around this, the no mask. The no mask is said to be a type of mask used in Japanese theater that when tilted different ways can show different emotions. For example, tilting it back is supposed to show sadness, whereas moving it from side to side is supposed to represent anger. In today's story, we're going to find that another feeling these masks can portray is the darkest parts of humanity. Join me for Osiroshi Saturday. April 2013, 6.30 a.m., Osaka. In the latest days of the spring season, the cherry blossoms had already fallen, and the trees were left with pearl-white blooms, contrasting against the tar-black tendrils that made up their branches. The first thing I recall thinking was that this day had started too early. 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. were normally delivery hours in Japan, so all my sleepy brain could muster was that this delivery must be urgent. If only I had known how right I was. was a letter and a package from my good friend, Kaito Yamamoto, a college buddy from Tenjin Gaidan University. We had been in two classes together, Japanese mythology and introduction to photography. We had quickly recognized each other for our strengths and weaknesses. Oddly, it was I who was the mythology otaku and Kaito who would become my camera senpai. We teamed up and began helping one another ace exams and art projects at an accelerated rate. It was from this that our bond grew and we became loyal friends. On multiple occasions, we had vouched for each other. We had gotten each other's back. So even after school ended and we headed into the real world, being employed with nine to five jobs and paying taxes, I knew getting this letter meant I would need to tend to whatever my loyal friend needed. Opening the package, I found the contents to be ragged. A weathered photo journal and a hastily written letter in English. Strange for Kaito, although he was bilingual, English had not been his first language. From what I could discern from the included letter and the related pages of the photo diary, Kaito had been given a news assignment. He had dreaded this long before he had even gotten into the reporting and photography biz. You see, Kaito and his family, the Yamamotos, had already claimed fame and fortune long before Kaito had earned a single yen. His father, Yamamoto Sr., had been a well-known no-gaku or no-mask actor. This would not be so odd if it had been a skill handed down through his family lineage, but such was not the case. Yamamoto Sr. and his incredible no-acting skill movements and techniques that usually take decades of training to perfect had seemingly come from nowhere. His technique could not be denied, and alas, he forged a way into an otherwise closed-off career to none other than those families born into it. Yamamoto enjoyed nearly a half of a century of success and progress, worked his way up through shows all over Japan. His greatest achievements were the recognition he was given by the major bunraku, nogaku, and kabuki playhouses all over the country. He won award after award and soon found himself in a house full of trophies. 
It wasn't until the years later, deep into his career, that people began to see small fractures in Yamamoto Sr.'s sanity. It was subtle at first, starting with what plays he chose to perform. In the beginning, he chose only lighthearted themes, with happy characters, making the best of life struggles. But by the age of 70, he refused to do anything but the darkest plays. His favorites being Kurozaku, The Black Mao, or Arachi Ga Hara, In the Fields of Arachi, a play surrounding a miserable old woman whose life is full of unending sadness when her husband dies and she is left to sew cheap threads in the mountains to earn what little she can to survive. For the whole opening of the play, she sulks and drones in a depressing soliloquy until she is raised by the visit by a group of nomadic hermits. They thank her for a place to stay and humor her by resting and listening to her speak about how pointless and nihilistic her dwindling life is. The speech becomes too depressing though, even for the appreciative hermits, and they beg her to stop. She apologizes and excuses herself from the room, but not before telling the men, please, wherever they rest, do not open the door connected to the shed next to the house. The men, unable to rest after having their head filled with the woman's depressing stories, dare to open the door. The very door they were told to leave alone. Behind the door, they become horrified, for when they open it, they see a large pile of decaying corpses writhing with maggots, blackening from rot. Even more frightening is the fact that he realizes the woman's corpse is among the ones he has just found. Opening the letter, I read it, and read of Kaito's desperation. In a short synopsis, it went over how he had come upon the mansion due to the report he was given. He had filed through his father's old things, trying to find the past history of what had driven him so mad in the house, why his career had ended in him taking his own life in a fit of sanity. Well, the answer had come to him quicker than he had expected and it was through the very no mask that his father had worn. You see, according to the letters, and according to what Kaito had discovered through multiple writings and scribblings of his father, through mad diaries and journals, he found his poor father admitting to one of the most cursed items. A cursed item he had given his life to. You see, it was the very no masks that he'd wear in his plays that he said were of a demonic form. How could this be? How could a mask be a demon? Was the mask the demon? Or did the demon bring the mask? Or were they both one? Or did the mask itself make the wearer the bodily form of the demon? These questions cannot fully be answered as it would take someone with far more knowledge of the metaphysical to understand. Nonetheless, what Kaito could muster from the scribblings and mad writings of his father was that this mass was cursed in such a way that it fed upon the user and all that he could muster and feed to the mask. How did he feed the mask? Well, how does one feed demons? Through sacrifice, through ritual, through blood. You see, many a time a handmaid had had an accident or an unfortunate situation in which she fell to her death or had landed upon some sort of utensil that was sharp in its manner. Unfortunate for them, 
many had wound up dead. But due to my father's career and his high standing place in the community, the police had been able to overlook most of these deaths. Unfortunate for the handmaids, though, their blood fed the mask. And as the mask grew stronger, so did Yamamoto Sr.'s skill. But so did the control of the mask over Yamamoto. Truly this is what must have driven him insane, thought Kaito. Truly this is what caused him to go into his fit of madness that ended with him taking his own life and forfeiting the manor. An inheritance Kaito himself had never won it due to the fact that he had watched his own father go mad in the last few years of his life. Now the manor brought only unhappiness to him, and the only reason he was forced to go there now was due to his own employment, asking to do a quick checkup and write up and report as to conspiracy theories that they think had gone on with why the mansion was left to decay. Unfortunate for Kaito, and for me now as well, he had not returned from this assignment. Alls was left with this letter and photo book. Putting these clues together and journeying over to the manor itself would be the only way I would solve this. The last little bit of scribbling? Find the Ubo. The Ubo mask. Which mask is the Ubo mask, I wonder? I didn't know, but Kaito said upon returning to the house, I would definitely know right away. He said it would be easy to spot, for I would not have to look for it. It would find me. And when it did, I was to take it. Take it and remove it from the house, by any means possible. This was his final wish if he did not return. And so, I would follow through with it. My trip was hurried and without problems. I got to the town and began to investigate the very ghost town known as Kagechome. Translated loosely, the shadow district, Kagechome, is known for the fact that it is devoid of most human life. Wandering the streets, I could confirm that. Houses darkened, windows barred, painted over, shut out, light unable to reach into the windows. I had arrived at an early 4.30 p.m long before night would fall. But soon I would find it would take me till nightfall to find the Yamamoto Manor. Wandering the streets and searching without any sort of GPS or map that had been updated for the occasion, I found myself looking at obsolete Koen maps and finding nothing that would lead me directly there. Until suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, there it was, Yamamoto Manor. It was odd. The manor sat so still and quiet. I could not even hear the sounds of animals, bugs, insects, or the locusts of the night. It was as if everything and anything could sense this was not a place to be lived in anymore. As soon as I entered the house, I could feel it, the presence of whatever had possessed this house, these masks, these people, this person, what had so sacrificed, what had been ritualized, which had bled out upon the floor of these very hallways. At first it seemed merely a creepy, creepy area to explore. 
I would be taking photographs myself and doing my best to cover the rest of the work Kaito could not. But as I wandered these halls, the tension grew. A tension I cannot put words to. Ineffable tension, if you will. Nonetheless, it grew. It grew to a point, to a zenith, to where I could hear voices muffled through the hallways. I could hear the sounds of a no play going on, yet I could see no players upon the stage. I could hear the cries and the wails of the handmaids. I could hear the echoing songs of the no mask and the no gaku. What was this place and what did it hold? Finally, I came upon it, the Ubo mask. Mask of the old lady. As soon as I stared at it, I knew exactly what Kaito had meant. There was something extremely wrong with this mask. As I approached it, it felt like it was moving. It looked, it appeared, it seemed as though it was shaking of its own will, back and forth vibrating. And that's when I noticed it had a life of its own. It got up by itself, and the cloak next to it came with it. It donned a kimono and began to run on its own. I could see almost a full embodiment around it, some sort of beastly shape encompassing the entirety of the mask and the kimono, running through the hallways, chasing after me. What I would do, I did not know, but I continued to run as fast as I could with my camera, with everything I had had, hoping that I could get to the Iriguchi, the escape, the exit out of this house, but I knew, I knew I had to get the mask. I would search just for that, and when I had it, I was gone. Just as I reached the very threshold of the gate and the door, I turned back and realized, just like a vapor, the air, the spirit, the very wind of the Kame-sama had dropped from the kimono. The mask and its wardrobe had fallen down to the floor. whose true identity has been exposed is transformed into a terrifying, vengeful spirit. Grabbing the mask, I put it back into my backpack. I did exactly what Kaito had willed. I left that house as soon as I could and headed back. What had gone on in there? Had I really seen what I had seen? Had a mask actually gotten up and moved through the hallway as though it were a being? Truly, I don't know. But this is my story. What is true and what is myth of these masks, I will never truly know and will forever remain a skeptic. Nonetheless, the story you have heard today is partially real and partial fantasy. Of course, things have been dramatized and fantasized to add expression to the story. Nonetheless, some very creepy things did take place at this manor. And as you can see, I retrieved quite a few creepy photos from this place. Believe what you want with the stories you've heard today. Until next time, I am Unrested, and this has been... Saturday!